slightly better, slightly better is better than not good. Slightly better is better than not good. Slightly better is better than not good. Hi, I'm Abby. I have a lot of records and this is Vinyl Monday. So welcome back or welcome if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the series where once a week I sit down and just talk about albums that I love. If 20 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds, both here on my channel and over on my Instagram. So there are quite a few new faces around here from last week's episode, which was Neutral Milk Hotels in the Aeroplane Over the Sea. Uh, so if you're new to the Vinyl Monday journey, hi! Um, usually I do albums from the 60s and the 70s and I dress to match the record, but I will be mixing in some records from the 90s and 2000s, 2010s, even as recently as last year from time to time. I would love to mix in more of the albums that I love. Also, you might notice my pinky finger here is looking a little blue or green, gray, yellow. I don't know. It's been all the colors of the rainbow this week, and that is because... <laughs> Gosh, I wish it was a cool reason. I was just loading my washing machine and I have a top loader, so the lid just fell on my hand. Uh, might look a little gray for the next couple weeks, but there's still circulation in there. I promise I will be fine. No need to worry. And if I lose a finger, hey, Another gimmick to add to the channel, right? Enough of the nonsense. Let's just get to this week's record, hopefully without any more incident. This week we are talking about Strange Days by the Doors. I am the Lizard Queen! Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you want to play along, I uh, make a game out of guessing what album I'm going to cover next. All you gotta do is check out my community tab. I post my hints over there, as well as polls and other fun behind the scenes stuff. You should go check it out. All right, so let's take the plastic off. So my copy is a repress. This is a really nice heavyweight vinyl run from I think 2009. I managed to get this used. I was really lucky to get it used, honestly. The Strange Days cover art is by William S. Harvey and photographed by Joel Brodsky. These two were Electra's go-to cover art designers. They also worked on The Doors Self-Titled and Waiting for the Sun, Van Morrison's Astral Weeks, Funkadelic Maggot Brain, and... Ah! My boys! So the Strange Days cover art features circus performers, sort of. Um, they couldn't find a trumpet player to be part of their ensemble, so Brodsky paid some random cab driver like five bucks to stand in and just hold this trumpet for the photo. I love it. And Brodsky's assistant is standing in as the juggler, which is why he isn't really juggling anything. If you look closely, he's just kind of throwing the rubber balls in the air and hoping something sticks. This was photographed at Sniffin Court in New York City. We don't get any text overlay stating the group's name or the album title, but we do see the guys in this little poster in the background and the album title appears as a flyer. However, we do get that Doors logo on the back cover in that green text pretty much ripped right from self-titled. On the inside, we have this insert with all of the lyrics and this gorgeous photo of the guys. I love this photo so much. I kind of want to get a second beater copy just so I can put this up on my wall somewhere. On Strange Days, of course, we have the legendary Jim Morrison on vocals and playing the Moog synthesizer. We have Ray Manzarek on keys and harpsichord, Robbie Krieger on guitar, and John Densmore on drums. We do have a couple special guests cropping up on this record, including Doug Lubon playing the bass. 
This album was produced by Paul Rothschild. He was the longtime producer of The Doors and engineered by Bruce Botnick. His name has come up more than once on this series, not just in the LA Woman video. All right, enough. I can't get sidetracked. Roll transition. <laughs> So it all starts when the Doors use their clout to get an advanced copy of Sgt. Pepper's. At the time, Sgt. Pepper's was the most expensive album ever made. Uh, the Beatles would have spent something like $667,000 in today's money, and a good chunk of that cash went to the recording technology. Take something like A Day in the Life, right? That song straight up would not have been possible a short two years before this record's release. Uh, it's one thing to have a concept like Sgt. Pepper's, something that requires very, very elaborate production, right? It's another thing entirely to be able to execute it. The Beatles had the resources to do just that, and the doors are blown away by what they hear. They don't just want to adapt the super elaborate, psych pop, sometimes experimental thing to what they already have going for them. I should have picked up self-titled for that. This was just released in January, so we're talking like spring of 67 right now. All of this is happening very fast. After talking to Paul and Bruce, they are ready to pull out all the stops to make their big ideas happen. They are gonna use everything recording technology has to offer to make this happen. They hop in the studio in the summer of 67, uh, they go to Sunset Sound in LA to start work on Strange Days. Now, quite a few of the songs we see on this track listing had been written at the same time as the self-titled material or even earlier. The Doors had been sitting on Moonlight Drive for a while, they demoed it in 65, and honestly probably had it around for even longer. Maybe the most famous story surrounding Strange Days is that of Jim coming up with People Are Strange. As Doors stories so often begin, Jim was in one of his moods. All the guys were living in Laurel Canyon at the time, Robbie and John were living together, so one night Jim just kind of turns up at their house ready to afflict them with his mood. As John recalled in his book, this story was also told in the Laurel Canyon documentary, uh, the three of them took an early morning walk up to the top of the canyon to watch the sunrise. Uh, I don't know where Ray was, I guess he was still getting his beauty sleep. Watching the sunrise, thinking of, I don't fucking know, life, it really lifted Jim's spirits, so he went home and wrote the beginnings of People Are Strange. Uh, you wouldn't know Jim was feeling good reading the lyrics, but now, with this context, they feel a little cheeky. Side note, if you haven't seen the Laurel Canyon documentary, Oh my god! Change that? The other big hit this album boasts is Love Me Two Times. Robbie Krieger wrote a number of the big Doors hits, like Light My Fire and this one. It's about a sailor shipping out and, as Ray stated, and I quote, either lust and loss or multiple orgasms, I'm not sure which. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Doors in one sentence. Now that the Doors have an outline of their vision, production is able to bring in cutting-edge equipment. Bruce Botnick brings in an 8-track machine to get that layers-on-layers-on-layers on layers sound. And Paul Beaver brings in and programs a Moog synthesizer for Jim to play on the title track. Um, there's some wackier methods used in this production, too. To get that Wizard of Oz wind machine sound in the back of Horse Latitudes, um, Botnick recorded white noise from a tape recorder, then hand wound the tape at varying speeds to get the wind gusts. God, I wish I knew who was screaming in that song. And in one of the coolest things I've heard through all of Vinyl Monday research, Ray Manzarek plays the keys backwards on Unhappy Girl. Now, now this isn't the way you think it is with 
Ray writing a part backwards to sound the way he wanted it to forwards. Nay, nay. Ray quite literally reverse engineered Unhappy Girl. He wrote the whole thing forwards, then as he was recording, read all his sheet music backwards, so he would be playing everything backwards. Then from there, the tape was reversed to make it go forwards, and he overdubbed from that. The mental gymnastics that took! Clearly Ray had never heard the Abigail DeVoe modus operandi, which is work smarter, not harder, but you gotta admit that takes some serious musicianship to do. The track listing of Strange Days goes as follows. <laughs> up side one we have the title track strange days followed by your lost little girl then love me two times next unhappy girl then comes the interlude horse latitudes which goes right into the side one closer moonlight drive opening up side two we have people are strange followed by my eyes have seen you then i can't see your face in my mind and the album closes with the 11 minute long epic, When the Music's Over. Strange Days was released in September of 1967, just nine months after self-titled. Like I said, all of this is happening really fast. Love Me Two Times proved to be a little much for radio play back then. Um, New Haven, Connecticut banned the song for being too controversial, thus making the song more controversial. Wow, I sure do love 60s music industry logic. So the question I wanted to answer with this video is why does everyone seem to sleep on Strange Days when it has five of the best Ten Doors songs on it? And a little bit of that has to do with its release. Now, Elektra jumped the gun and put Strange Days out before self-titled had the chance to fall out of the charts or should i say even fall out of the top 10. this thing's enduring success proved to chokehold the success of this album it was the worst selling morrison era doors album so thank you electra very cool despite sales being abysmal for what this band and the label was used to uh strange days was still well received though some recognized its close proximity to self-titled as being its Achilles heel. I'm gonna read this one from my notes because I found it particularly interesting and relevant. Richie Unterberger said, with hindsight, one has the sense that the best songs of the batch had already been cherry-picked for the debut album. For that reason, the band's second effort isn't as consistently stunning as their debut. Do I agree with this? Eh, we're getting there. More positive reviews cited Strange Days as the point where the Doors really found their footing and transcended the psych genre. The Rolling Stone review upon release cited its intricacy and its subtlety as strong points. It also compared its structure to a Greek tragedy. I love that, and I'm sure Jim loved it too. Jim was a big old nerd. I have stated in the past in my LA Woman video, one of this channel's greatest hits, um, that this is my favorite Doors record. So, what exactly do I think of Strange Days? <laughs> Going in, my college buddy Matthew, he's one of the biggest Doors fans I know, got me into Strange Days my last year of college. Um, I have memories of him playing this record in his brown station wagon on the way to a diner trip we all made after a night of drinking. <laughs> um, whenever I hear these songs, I think of going to that diner and getting stuck in the rain in that parking lot and like, what did we expect? The forecast literally said it was gonna rain, but we were like, oh, let's just chance it anyway. <laughs> Opening this section with a flaming hot f***ing take, Strange Days is more of a response 
to Sergeant Pepper's than their Satanic Majesty's request was. Because no, Satanic Majesty's literally wasn't a response to Sergeant Pepper's. Their productions began around the same time, and Satanic Majesty's was just the Stones's misguided misadventure into psych, which was constantly interrupted by drug busts and court cases and Keith stealing Brian's girl. Uh, basic fucking mathematics, people. Like, I'm known for being bad at math, but come on, even I have this one figured out. Anyway, look at the history of Strange Days, and it all starts with Sergeant Peppers. This might not be quite as close of a sonic response, but it's a response to Sgt. Pepper's in spirit. One of Strange Days' strongest points is its multifaceted production. Um, peel back one layer of any one of these songs and you get like three more layers. A uh, Psych was all about pushing recording technology to its absolute limit to get the glitteriest and shiniest of results, and The Doors does that fantastically on Strange Days. Dare I say Bruce Botnick was just as much a producer on this record as Paul Rothschild was? I mean, a lot of the coolest moments on this album happened because of him. Strange Days' second strongest point is its totally distinct sound. The Doors really packed everything they're known for, uh, highlights and cliches alike, into a hyper-concentrated package. And I mean it's ultra-concentrated. This album is only 34 minutes long. I think it's the shortest record I've covered on this series, even shorter than Cheap Thrills. Uh, love it or pass on it, you gotta commend The Doors for crafting such a distinct sound for themselves. The whole vibe of this album is pensive and moody, which is what this stage of The Doors did so well. It's mysterious in the same way that those darker cuts of Jefferson Airplane's surrealistic pillow are. This came out in February of 67, a few months before this album. Maybe this is a response to this as well. By the way, so I'm so sorry for teasing you guys with the airplane emoji last week and getting your hopes up for Surrealistic Pillow when I was in fact covering in the aeroplane over the sea. I promise I will rectify this in like May. Anyway, back to the vibes. The title track of this record really should have been in a 60s psychedelic spy movie. No, I'm not talking about Austin Powers. Is a little bit Jeff Beck slash Yardbirds and even a little bit Airplane, Diet White Rabbit. It's a great choice as its opening track and title track. It's really the thesis statement of Strange Days. And of course, the other thesis statement of this record, People Are Strange. I know this is Laurel Canyon through and through, but that song really feels like going down into a New York subway station and just observing the people that pass by. We have some of the best bass work on any Doors record appearing on this album. Again, shouting out the title track. Count on the Doors to have some of the most iconic bass lines of all time without having a formal bassist in their band. Shout out to Doug Lubon. It's that time in the video where I shout about the underrated track, Unhappy Girl is underrated as hell. This is where that really layered production starts to make itself apparent. You know, you hear that very subtle backtracking in the mix, uh, revealing that Ray played his shit backwards. It might be rigid with just that key part, but it's broken up by everything else, like the little blues in the background vocals and Robbie's slide work. We get some more of that rigid versus loopy dynamic. It's seriously the only way I can describe it. On Moonlight Drive, uh, you can absolutely tell that this material was written alongside, if I can find it, I'm really bad at organizing today, self-titled. The structures and motifs are very similar. 
Um, that is absolutely a double-edged sword. I love, love, love when Jim got to showcase his poetry on a Doors record, but it's a true highlight when he got to flex his flair for Greek drama. Uh, think the end, when the music's over, or horse latitudes. Um, it's one of the more bonkers moments on a Doors record. Is, and is it bad that it reminds me of the tunnel scene from Willy Wonka? Which direction we are going? Yeah, I watched way too many Gene Wilder films as a kid, and that explains so much about me. I can't see your face in my mind. Um, it's a fine track. Just alongside hits like Love Me Two Times and People Are Strange, uh, heavy hitters like the title track and Unhappy Girl, and the heavy hitter of this album, When the Music's Over, it just feels a little... meh. The weak spots on this album are glaringly apparent, so Richie, I agree with you on that part. But Strange Days' ambition and just how high these high points are it's consistently more stunning than the debut record, if you ask me. Which brings us to the piece de resistance of Strange Days, When the Music's Over. This is the best door song! That distorted guitar in the intro is just mean as hell. I don't know how else to describe it. It's menacing hanging low in that mix. It sounds kind of like an engine revving, and of course, Robbie would perfect this on the title track of L.A. Woman. And then the distorted solo about three minutes in. I, my first listen through, my jaw dropped. I had to collect it from my lap and put it back in my face. We don't give enough love to the rest of the doors, truly. Robbie and Ray really show out on When the Music's Over. Ray with that spine-chilling crescendo about six minutes in gives me the heebie-jeebies. Of course, we gotta talk a little bit more about Jim here. His lyrics were arguably just as strong an asset as his persona. Uh, cancel My Subscription to the Resurrection is my favorite lyric on here. Best Delivery, though, is What Have They Done to the Earth. Best Delivery, though, is What Have, what they, have they Done, done to the, the earth. earth. This whole song is another great showcase of Jim's drama skills. Is there any better psych, freak-out explosion of sound than the closing track of this album? Never in my life did I think I would be headbanging to a Vox Continental, but count on a Doors breakdown to do it. Uh, another flaming hot f***ing take incoming, when the music's over, over the end, any day. I think what I meant by why does everyone ignore Strange Days is more like why is it so overlooked when the material on here is so much more developed than what's on self-titled. Um, sure, there's duds, but moments like when the music's over highlight the progression that the doors have made in such a short amount of time. This makes this sound like a collection of demos. Strange Days is everything self-titled is, but all of the ideas are more fleshed out. I had no idea that self-titled would be this relevant in this video. Might have to fast track this episode. Oh boy. Are there still plenty of cliches like melodramatic gym, bouncy bass lines, and Vox Continental Overload? Yes. But it's adventurous. It's polished. It shows off everybody's strong suits pretty equally. Uh, this is a well-balanced record in that, right? And it's hard to find a sense of balance when a band decides to go mucho crazy in the studio. Is Strange Days a perfect album? Of course not. There is no such thing as a perfect album, but in a lot of ways, 
its charm, its subtlety, its mastery at what it's trying to do and the excitement it builds, it's the perfect Doors album. Or perfect early Doors album. And for that reason, it's my favorite Doors album. My personal favorites on this one are the title track, Love Me Two Times, Unhappy Girl, People Are Strange, and When the Music's Over. If you want to keep up with all of my favorite songs from all of the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Vinyl Monday Spotify playlist linked in my description. And that is it. That is The Doors, that is Strange Days. What do you think of this period of The Doors? Do you agree with my assessment that Strange Days is a stronger record than self-titled? Or maybe you don't. Whatever you think, you should leave it in the comments. I love hearing what you guys have to say about the albums that I love. And if you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11 a.m. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye!